And good evening, everyone. Welcome to Pachakcha number 52. We are reaching astronomic numbers. And um, tonight we are collaborating with the New Zealand Maritime Museum, already the second time. So I'm very happy to be back here. Also very happy to be back in the countries for the one that know me. I've been in Europe for six months, so finally back. Um, before we start, I quickly want to say a big thank you to Michaela Journey. She works for the Maritime Museum and um, she contacted me while I was in Europe uh, about this kind of collaboration. It started at, as an exhibition at the moment about uh, on collaboration with uh, University of Auckland architecture students. We have them speaking here tonight. Um, so we were talking about basically a uh, uh, special edition of Peche Kucha, a waterfront edition. And um, for me, as a foreigner, there's a lot of waterfront in Auckland. So um, for me, it's not only particular this waterfront here. And so we sort of decided to theme it where city meets sea. This is a topic for tonight, where city meets sea. It is really um, a difficult topic, particular for Auckland, because um, the city meets the sea at a lot of places. And uh, as we will hear um, from Mifanwe Eves, she's an ar archaeologist. Um, she asked the question, which city meets which sea for Auckland? Tasman versus Pacific, Manukau versus Waitemata, Tam Tamaki South versus Tamaki North. Also, the ownership of the land where the city meets the sea or where the land meets the sea uh, was and probably still is not very clear. So we have John Miller speaking as a well-known documentary photographer, remembering Takapa Fao, Takapara Fao, Bastion Point, 40 years after. Um, it's a very crucial date, I think, Bastion Point, the protest uh, for the history of Auckland, so he will enlighten us about that. And in the backlight of that, we have got Tamsin Handley, she's an educationalist um, on a recent decolonized curriculum for schools, um, and she's also really well connected to uh, Bastion Point and also to what happened on the waterfront uh, in previous times. There's a rough muscle reef restoration program, and we hear Richelle Kaui McConnell, She's an environmental and social capital broker, and she will, um, she will talk, or she managed actually, uh, New Zealand's Aotearoa's only hapu-based muscle reef restoration program uh, on behalf of Nati Fatua Orakai. Um, as Auckland develops, of course, bicycling uh, in the last years really got more into the uh, known, into the media. The waterfront uh, in historical times possibly hasn't been very well known for cycling. Uh, there's a big change happening at the moment, so we, I'm happy to have Christopher Dempsey here. Um, and his theme is um, bicycle meet city meet sea. Since a few years, there are really great events happening in an area which was uh, once known as a tank farm, now Silo Park. Um, also really happy to have Simon von Prague here, who is uh, the director of Fresh Concept, who do a lot of those events at Silo Park. And his topic is the water's edge, the great connector, which uh, is now happening. So really happy to have him here. And then we have got Matt Ball. He is the head of communication from Ports of Auckland. And he um, basically wants to bring some light into what's behind the red fence. So his uh, chosen topic is uh, behind the red fence. I guess he, we are talking about the red fence close to the ferry terminal, and that's where the um, Auckland Harbor is, uh, ports of Auckland. And then, as I mentioned before, we have got uh, here in the Maritime Museum currently an exhibition running uh, with students from uh, University of Auckland. And uh, I'm not 
not that well in the known about this project exactly, but I know that uh, publisher Mark Graham uh, was involved uh, to work with the students, and I think he was a guest crit as well. So we have got Mark Graham speaking, followed by the student team from University of Auckland, uh, mainly about Kiwa, an iconic waterfront building, which I don't much, uh, uh, which I don't know much about. But this is uh, why I'm here as well, and this is why you are probably here as well to uh, get updated on, on what's happening from, from all the speakers, in particular this night about um, where the city needs to see. So I would like to thank you as well, uh, audience, all for coming. And I think we just start with Pachakcha number 52. Each picture will be shown for 20 seconds, and each speaker has got 20 slides to show. Thank you very much. Ah, tēnā koutoua katoa ka hui hui nei tātou tēnei pō Nā mihi tuatahi ki te mana whenua o Akarana Nā te whātua nui Kia ora koutou Right Oh, here we go. Um, this year, this January, uh, marked the 40th anniversary of the beginning of the Bastion Point dispute, which uh, the Ngāti Whātua people took to stop the uh, subdivision of their land by the Muldoon government in 1977, and uh, it began a 506-day-long um, uh, occupation um, there's a symbol of the uh, Lands and Survey Department, which has been graffitied, um, oh, okay. um, graffitied during the 1982 reoccupation. Uh, and this particular, oh, this, this is Alec Hawke. This is the gathering, last the beginning of last January, the 5th of January, with Alec Hawke, one of the Hawke brothers, speaking, and with some of my. A3 photographs uh, on the bottom left hand of the frame that I brought, took up the photographs that I'd taken at the time or a bit afterwards. Uh, this, is, this is Margaret Jones' appropriation of the Trigg Station as a, a dwelling unit, which was confused by the Commissioner of Crown Lands, George Macmillan, as a privy, which he was very angry about. But, uh, and in the, in the distant background is Tim Shadbolt's Shadbolt Towers that he constructed um, and this is a photograph of him holding the photograph with his uh, dwelling uh, on it. That he attended the uh, celebrations, came up from Invercargill especially for it. And uh, uh, was, he got the photograph and I got his book. Uh, and uh, um, <coughs> he, he, he had, it was seven metres high. Oh, this is, this is the Arahanui meeting house with uh, uh, late 1977 with a small group of... Um, Young youngsters there with uh, Dana Hawke's big painting. She's the little one holding the um, photograph, uh, not the photograph, the uh, the drawing, with her older sister Celeste uh, standing behind her. And that is Dana on the left and Celeste on the right holding the photograph of themselves I took of them 40 years ago. Uh, so um, and this is how they're quite pleased to see uh, uh, their uh, this, this photograph. So Dana took off with that. Um, I was quite pleased to give that to her as a memento of that particular time. Um, this is the Arohanui meeting house, the big uh, house that was set up in April so the um, people could survive a very harsh winter in 1977. Um, on the far right-hand corner is the present Mayor of, Wellington, uh, Mayor of Auckland, Phil Goff, with um, uh, Walter Linney, second from the right, the leader of the... Uh, there is Phil Goff on the right, um, uh, um, um, Walter Linney from the Vanuatu Party, Colin Clark, and Reverend John, uh, George Armstrong. Um, uh, Walter Linney visited to um, give us support, and of course, they were fighting for them. This, this is Sharon Hawkes. Uh, this is Joe Hawkes' daughter, Sharon's um, uh, dwelling on the on the uh, point. With the, and uh, of course, the people the people in the houses right back behind complained because her uh, structure was blocking their view of Rangitoto. So she, she, 
she did this uh, mural of Rangi Toto on the back, so to 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 placate them. Um, so uh, and there's some, I'm not quite sure what the little dinghy is there. There's a couple of children staying. So these these photographs were taken in late 1977, around the time they had the, uh, a. Um, uh, a, a fundraising gala, and I'm I'm going to try and risk uh, reading a little bit out of Shadbolt's book about this uh, the, the fundraising. The highlight at the, at the end of an exciting day was a huge hangi. During the 1970s, it became fashionable to eat turkey at Christmas, but as Kiwis were never sure how long to cook them for, they arrived in the supermarkets with a thermometer stuck in their ribs, and uh, the garden and the house there. And when it and when it popped out, the turkey was cooked. Joe Hawk was given the honour of lifting the first sack. As soon as the soil had been scraped back, a huge half-cooked rat staggered out of the first sack and, <laughs> and collapsed in front of the queue of 200 hungry people. A deep groan erupted from the, from the crowd, and that's the watchtower that was set up there too. But Joe, in a display of brilliant leadership, announced in a loud voice, Well, the thermometer's popped out, so the hangi must be cooked. The groans changed, changed to laughter, and we all enjoyed a hearty dinner. The gala made $2,000, a lot of money in 1977, so that's helped us sustain. Now, 1982, there was sort of a reoccupation. This is his father, Terry Dibble, leading a group of, uh, of activists and Ngāti Whāta supporters around the point, and there were, there were these boundary markers that were placed sim to symbolically de delineate the rohe of Ngāti Whātua, and they had a little session painting them up, and this is May... Um, Hariata Ropata, uh, quite a well-known artist who's um, painted, decorating one of these poles. And uh, so when they were finished, they were taken and people carried them around and the next, the next shot coming up has got a... Uh, uh, people are standing with them. Um, there they are there. So you can see various... Uh, so that was 1982. Um, there was a... The government in 1978 offered to give half the land back if the tribe paid $200,000, and uh, that got turned down, and so they sent the troops in on the 25th of May 1978 and chucked everyone off. So, of course, they say Bastion Point is not for sale. And, uh, um, but in the, there was a treaty process that took place in the late 80s. 1988, the, um, the, the Longy government... Um, decided to agree to hand the land back to Ngāti Whātua. And so that's um, uh, the particular situation today where Ngāti Whātua has their own land. Here's Joe. This is Joe, and the lady on the right is his sister Dawn, and the one in the white is a, a Patu. And uh, I think there's another lady, another relative sitting, holding the, my photo of, the, of the, the, the previous copy of the previous photo. And um, uh, it's really great that uh, Joe... Was in, and his family were celebrated that day last month. Kia ora. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Graham, and uh, I'm here to talk about Kiwa, uh, which is a concept that's kind of floating around out there, uh, around something that we think should happen on the waterfront. Just uh, by way of a little bit of explanation, um, I am I'm not an architect or an urban planner. I am not Maori, uh, but I am an, uh, an Aucklander. And I'm third generation Aucklander, born and bred here, and lived here most of my life except for a brief stint overseas. Uh, and uh, during that period, in fact, um, as a 16 year old, I was privileged to be able to have one of my friends at Rangitoto College when I was uh, in the sixth form, uh, seventh form actually, uh, say to me and a couple of mates, uh, we need to get down to Mission Bay because uh, something's going on. I had no idea what was going on. We zinged off down there, we played hooky for the afternoon and we zinged down to Mission Bay and we watched the police come in and march the protesters off. I was there on that day uh, until they actually tossed me off before the actual protesters, but it was, um, it was quite uh, an eye-opening experience and uh, I was quite privileged to be a part of that part of uh, Auckland history. And uh, that's kind of what feeds into what I am up here for. And uh, I have to apologise because I haven't had the greatest preparation, but I'm going to do my best and hopefully things will kind of work out as we go. So I'm about ready to go, so as soon as we kick off, 
off. Right. So um, I wrote here, how can we avoid this image and what it did for Sydney? Thinking, you know, actually, as I said, problems. Um, you know, how can you avoid this image? Because it is ubiquitous and it has come to represent what everyone wants to do. It's just create this iconic building downtown. Can we replicate it? Do we want to have something similar? And if so, what and how to implement? Now, this kind of thing has obviously been around for a very long time. Uh, and in fact, pause for emphasis. A really long time, <laughs> uh, as I said. Um, so look, Auckland is claimed to be the world's largest Polynesian city. In fact, as I started to think about it, it's actually the world's largest Maori city. But we don't recognize that. And in fact, if you come downtown, where can you see Maori or Polynesian culture on the streets? Now, obviously, you know, hopefully everybody knows what this building is, the Frank Lloyd Wright design, Guggenheim Museum. Here's the quote that I have beside this. Culture is not only beneficial to cities, in a deeper sense, it's what cities are for. A city without poets, painters, and photographers is sterile. Now, this is the Haidar Aliyev Center in Azerbaijan. Um, 250 people were moved off their, their homes, moved out of their homes by force to create this stunning building designed by the unfortunately now deceased Zaha Hadid, but it's a significant design, uh, but I wonder if it works. And, and look, here's another Hadid building, this time in, uh, in um, and please excuse my uh, pronunciation, Shangsa Mishi Hu. I don't know, uh, please forgive me. Um, but look, the thing is that in New Zealand, in Auckland, where do you go to have a touch point for Maori culture? That isn't the War Memorial Museum where it's behind glass or it's a, um, it's a you know, show and tell kind of uh, presentation. Where can you go to experience contemporary Maori and Pacific culture? You know, something like the Pompidou Centre, where, you know, if you go there, and I have been here, there are street performers, and there are cafes and bars, and there are people lined up and hanging out around the building. There is a creation of a sense of place. And uh, at the recent waterfront symposium, uh, the Elbe Philharmonie uh, uh, building here, and also uh, an earlier slide showed the v &A Museum of Design uh, that's been built in Dundee. Both were there to try to create a sense of place, not as the significant building, but as something that caps it off. And this, interestingly enough, is a perfect personification of this. Everybody knows the building, the Guggenheim Bilbao. But the significant point about this that I found out in my research is that it was the final crown jewel in a setting that had been created over many, many years. This is the Dundee uh, Museum of Design. So, just plonking a building in the middle of something and hoping that something's going to happen around it isn't going to do it. So whatever goes on down at the waterfront, there has to be that creation of a sense of place. These are street scenes from a range of Pacific cities. Santiago, Panama, Taipei, San Diego, Brisbane, Auckland. Now look at that and tell me which one is Auckland, which one's Santiago, which one is... Uh, San Diego. You can tell Santiago and Panama, but not San Diego versus Auckland versus Adelaide versus Brisbane. You know, do we share that much of our cultural uh, connection with our American and Australian cousins? No. There is something that makes us distinct, and what makes us distinct is Maori and, and the wider Pacific culture. This, you know, there was the, the Te Papa building, which unfortunately I don't think quite hits what we were tra trying to achieve. This is the Frank Gehry design that we didn't get. And if you're wanting that star architect type thing, then maybe this would have been a better option. But I don't know really how well it would have worked without the, without the construction of something around it. The Lean Lie building. Now I'm desperate to get down there. I haven't visited this building yet. It looks fantastic. I, I, ha I have no idea what kind of sense of place it 
it builds there, but you know, it, it feels quite imposing and not overly friendly. I don't know if I'd like to sit there, whereas what we have here is the Tuhoi building that, to my mind, is, is welcoming and, and, and asks me to come in and be a part of it. It's a personification of the culture. It's their heart. And that's what I'd like to see created in Auckland. Now, if you look at this waterfront, there's uh, our new uh, tower. I, I don't mind that, you know, as long as the bottom is done where there's uh, pedestrian contact. But if you look at this, what's the building that jumps out? To my mind, it's not the Sky Tower. It's the ferry building. That's the iconic waterfront building in Auckland at the moment. Now, we've had a bunch of designs around Kiwa, and these guys are a great, talented bunch of kids are going to show you some, some more designs around what could possibly go on down here in some kind of a great building. But what we want to do here is create a home for Maori and Pacific culture where artists can create and collaborate and, 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 uh, and demonstrate and be a cultural touch point for both New Zealanders and the wider world. And to my mind, you know, Tank Farm's great, but it's kind of removed from the city. This is the heart of Auckland right there. And at the moment, this is the heart of the Pacific, the Chabao Centre in New Caledonia, designed by Renzo Piano. Again, I haven't been here, but imagine something like this on the waterfront in Auckland, creating that touch point between the cultures. That's it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, we are, to quote Mark, the amazing, talented bunch from Auckland Uni. Uh, we're architecture students. We're now in our fifth year, and um, the Kiwa project was done last year in our fourth year, which was led by architect Linda Simmons and co-tutored by the uh, JASMAX Wakamaya Cultural Advisory Board. Um, what we're going to show you is a mix of our and our classmates' work throughout the semester-long project. Um, as Mark Graham spoke about, the brief was for a proposed cross-cultural art and performance centre for one of, uh, Auckland's, uh, one of the world's biggest Pacific and Māori cities right here in Tamaki Makoto. Uh, as students, we were guided by Māori and Pacific notions of spatial composition rather than looking at a theatre through the Western gaze. And so we're all just going to talk and hopefully learn something, yeah? <laughs> Uh, so our site was in Marsden Wharf and the idea was to reintegrate the water's edge with the city and encourage a re-establishment of interaction and engagement with our waterfront to knock down physical and conceptual barriers that prevented this from occurring in Auckland's contemporary urban context. So basically I'm going to walk you through our process. After initially visiting the site, we drew pretty abstract site drawings that we all laid on a table and zoomed in on and cropped and we combined them with our peers' drawings to create unique compositions. The intention of this was to remove ownership of work and to encourage a cross-pollination of ideas. So after that, we began to physically model these photographed compositions. And in so doing, we had to, for the first time, start to think about texture and spatiality and to move toward thinking in, a, in more architectural terms. And through photographing these models, we were able to place ourselves in them and find new perspectives and engage with them in whole new ways. Our uh, next step toward producing architecture was making measured sectional drawings of our models and establishing our architectural vocabulary. So this vocabulary was a tool set that we'd be using for the duration of the semester. Producing these drawings helped us interrogate the forms we were producing and start to visualize them as architectural parts of a whole. Throughout the duration of these initial exercises, we were making a palette of textures and lines that we would use to create our initial theater interior space. And like our drawings, we made compositions of multiple models using our own models and our fellow students, and sharing models in this way, and working together to take the photos aided us in coming up with some interesting spaces and forms. 
through modeling, we were thinking about interiority. We were thinking about bound darkness, about how we would go about creating texture in our theater space. This modeling and photographing phase was essential to our understanding of the atmospheric qualities of the theater we were designing. Rather than modeling everything digitally, we were engaging in a more human way. And this image illustrates the direct correlation between our initial decomposed drawings and our physical models. In this case, how someone, this is actually mine, can see metallic scales in the hatch drawing of a fellow student, and how borrowing from each other helped us create unique results. As this phase of the design process concluded, so throughout the semester, as a studio group, we had constant engagement with Jazz Max's Waka Maya group, who held sessions on culturally inclusive Māori design principles and customs, as well as marae spatial layout. And so these became really important drivers at all stages of design. What became evident on the site during the early stages was its enormity. So one of the main issues was to tie the existing urban edge into the project scheme and make decisions for the wider wharf right up to the water. In this scheme, the wider port is excavated to bring the water closer to the city edge. The same idea is employed in this project of bringing people to the water by connecting existing axes in the city landscape to the urban design. And so drawing people into the building and out to the water's edge in a continuing public layout uh, this layout functions in both directions for people coming from the city and sea. Acknowledged also is the existing elements of the site, like the structure which is currently being used as a car shelter on Key Street, and reimagining them as new elements in the scheme, using their familiarity to draw the flow of people from the street into the site, and in this case, activating the street front with public programs. Um, so projects architects acknowledge Alton's bicultural history and lost narratives. Uh, some projects, such as this one, establish Waharoa, which are gateways on key points that have not been acknowledged in our cityscape, such as Emily Place, which is the last remaining point, the stub of uh, Te Reringa Araiti, which is Point Brunamat, mine to produce fill for the Auckland CBD. Uh, spatial arrangements were dictated by formal Māori and Pacific customs, such as porphyry, and these multifaceted customs have never had an architectural presence in Auckland's urban fabric. By architecturalizing these customs and processes, a contemporary urban Pacific architecture was born. Reclaiming the waterfront and our connection to our neighbors on the vast plain of Kiwa, the Pacific Ocean, was a key component of our design. In some cases, privatized land was liberated for public benefits, such as this. Uh, to create public plazas, beaches, and to reconnect Auckland's true heart of the city with the city, which is the Waitemata Harbour. Uh, arrival from sea was privileged over land, as is shown in uh, historic typologies of Pacific Island architecture, which is separated by water rather than land. This is shown in the scheme, which depicts the arrival of a visitor being guided towards the sea facing Waharoa. This interaction is informed by Pacific customs such as va, which is a social, physical, and spiritual relationship between two entities. Uh, arrival from land was dictated by layers of protocol involved in Māori customs such as porphyry. The visitor was welcomed and brought forward through the various spaces into the whare tāpiri, or the theatre. Clear distinctions needed to be made here between uh, the ātea space and the informal public space as not infringe on the tapu of the spaces involved. Hongi, the exchanging of breath between the home and the visitor. So this perspective showed how we interpret the traditional practice in an architectural form. So you can see the visitor floats in through a suspended cards and with the blinking light acting as an exchanging of breath. These sections are directly derived from our working process. The Fari Tapere was born from the idea of being a theater of the land. It's buried deep into the ground to reach for the primordial bedrocks evoking the past history and providing a space for expression for all cultures. The form is inspired by a diving tanifa. It's a water monster of uh, Maori legends. The design process uh, comes from the photocopy of the site drawings and also sectional drawings and physical models. The theatre provides performance um, as though you are walking into another dimension. And the upper part of the theatre 
house the um, performance area, and the lower part have a series of tunnel and passageway. So through the investigation of different material and texture, and we reinterpreted the meaning of a Western theater, and then hence we did creating a new oceanic architecture theater. Thank you. Just fiddle with us, is it all? Can you hear me? Am I here? Am I here? <sighs> Tenekoto, Tenekoto Kato. I am your friendly local, just by way of introduction, friendly local archaeologist, um, senior at the Auckland Council, the new form of council, which means my fiefdom runs from Wellsford down to the Bombay Hills. My goal, according to the Resource Management Act, my person, my reason for being, is to protect and enhance historic heritage. If you want to know what historic heritage is, then you should be reading your RMA definitions, which is part two, which is not going to come off the top of my head at the moment, but it's things like archaeological sites, technology, architecture, someone pull out part, um, the RMA, it's not coming off the top of my head. I also have another little tool in my back pocket called the Unitary Plan, which has recently been in front of you all quite a bit. Um, it's been sort of sliced and diced quite a bit and isn't terribly useful from a historic heritage point of view anymore, which is probably to the joy of certain people who like building on land. I couldn't possibly comment. I could, but yeah, it's best not to. So, um, really interested in this topic because in my role, I get to look at all sorts of exciting developments that come before me like this creation that you folk were thinking of, that will come to me eventually. My role will be to deal with it as an archaeological effect, what is going to happen to the historic heritage when you put that in the landscape. Because I use the RMA, criteria, not the historic, uh, heritage, this, mm, heritage New Zealand Pohari Taonga Act. I use the RMA and so my definition for heritage is not controlled by a date and is not controlled by human interference. So my view of a landscape, my colleague and my view of a landscape is as a cultural landscape and is as far or as small as you draw it. So, sorry to go on, but my, um, my 20 slides, more or less, are to take you on a part of the story that I've been working on in my work realm, which is looking at the East-West Link, which was notified yesterday um, by the Environment Protection Authority, which will take a big slice off the top of the Manukau Harbour. Now, my point to you is that Auckland is not just the Waitemata. Um, and if you believe it is, you're a pack of harbourists. <laughs> this place where we are lucky enough to live is surrounded by water. We have harbours and bays all around us. Each one of them is a stepping stone to the other one. And where there is no water, there were tracks. So my desire in my presentation to you is to give you a drone's eye view, and I'm not talking about boring drone public servant, which of course they can be, but it's also to get you up in the air and looking across the isthmus, zooming into some spots, zooming out again. The flag I wave most loudly is for Monaco, because Monaco, the largest Polynesian city in the world. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> exactly. So what are we all here for? What is our ultimate game? And I believe there are certain um, 
There's a certain part of our community that wants us all to be pitched against each other in deciding which city is more important, which harbour is more important, which resource is most important. The ultimate game for me is to protect our heritage for future generations. It's not about us. Okay, yes, I get the hand. Okay. So, um, zooming into the Manukau, what do we know? This is very much a European documentary history. I am not going to even try and describe the stories that go with this place because it is not my gambit. We do know that 1827, Dervil popped in. Sam Marsden shunted by a couple of years later. Felton Matthew was, you know, shuffling around, drawing maps of some little town called Auckland eventually. Hochstetter got commissioned to draw this, that other map. We know what resources are here. This moves fast. You should stop at Manukau because it's a big one. It's got every kind of resource you possibly need. It was drawn up by a nice cross-section when you approach the Manukau Harbour. A chap called Commander Drury, he drew the Manukau Harbour, and there it is with a modern map on top of it, if you can spot the big roads. He drew it up in 1853. The Waitemata did not get drawn up until 1857. Only Hunga Manukau was more important. It was your closest international port to Sydney. And when you came in the heads there, your first stop was at Timber. You pulled up at Huya in Cornwallis. You went to Gibbons and Rose Sawmill, and you got timber. When you got as much timber as you wanted, you then moved on round the harbour. You went past bits of land, oh, it's 20 seconds as long sometimes, to where the Wesleyans were given a large chunk of land, which you might know as Titarangi Hillsborough. You then move on to Onehunga, where a fensible settlement got set up. Onehunga is particularly important because it was a traditional trading port. It's where the road from Waitemata ended, the portage from Tamaki came over, and the points therein, number one was the market, number two was the pub, number three was the road to Auckland, and number four was the Royal Admiralty shop for spas that had come from Matt Rose and the Gibbons Mill. Matt Rose Timber Mill, again number one, Number four was what left, was left of Gibbons sawmill. So they had sawmills everywhere. They're shopping. The Manukau is a huge supermarket. You bring stuff up from the Waikato. Number two was another pub, by the way, just in case. That is now a motorway with a new beach. This area, an old map superimposed with a modern one, is about to be altered further. Te Hopua Basin in the middle, has a freeway running down the middle of it. The railway line is disappearing. The harbour is going to Panuku. Zooming in on the basin there, you can't particularly see the detail, but where it's touching the sea was fresh water from Mangakiki. It comes out from under the lava flows, you get fresh water, kaimoana, shellfish, fresh, fresh oysters, and when you stand at the edge where that photograph is there, touching the land there and looking up, in the distance you can see that maunga, but you can also see a hell of a lot of other stuff in the middle, where the city's touching the sea in Onehanga. Again, number one is Maunga Kiki, but underneath, number three is the evolution of New Zealand's first blast furnaces. All the other numbers are timber mills, saw mills. Number two is the railway line, by the way, 1875. That was your main route to Wellington until 1922. But hey, Onehunga is not important, so let's quickly turn it into meat works, soap works, reclaim, forget the portage at St Anne's Creek, let's put a road through um, Tanifa, Tanifa soap. Everyone knows the soap works, the meat works and it's all reclaimed now, and the Westfield Railway Station is going to move and be closed. This is the view standing at, the t at that map, looking west to the Manukau Heads. Mangere is on your left. 
certain soap works in front of you, certain meat works all around you. Great South Road right in front of you. The trees are actually exotics. Soon to be replaced by Otahuhu, another fencible settlement. Not nearly as big as Onehunga's fencible settlement. Nothing to be proud of, but Onehunga was the first fencible settlement. Moving quickly around the harbour, because I could go on and I don't want to bore you. This is a particularly embarrassing, another embarrassing part of our history, where the Māori fencibles of Mangari lost their land because they were Māori fencibles who might have complied with all legal requirements. Interesting. Anyway, that land got confiscated and soon a bridge was built on it. A bridge that connected Onehunga with Mangari, the isthmus with the southern part, which supplied food for the European settlers. We've had a lot of arguments about this bridge and the replacement bridges on the rest of it, so it's up there in my mind. It's driving me nuts. But the evidence exists that tells me that Mangari and the airport and large mountains that have now been quarried away and other land areas and piles of rocks in the Mangari area that go by the name of Aurorangi or Ehimata have an ancient history that may link to the Wesleyans. But moving on past the airport, yes, there is still more settlement on the Manukau. It was a pulsating settlement and it's almost a mini city. What is a city? Waiuku at the very base. There's that famous pub, not quite as old as the newly thin and only hunger, which was on the site of Te Whero Whero's cottage. But we end back in only hunger. Where's that? Does anyone know? There's a chocolate fish for anyone who does. Thank you. Hard act to follow. Awesome. Beautiful to hear those um, speakers before us. Kia ora. Uh, tēnā koutou, he mihi. This is just my intro. <laughs> uh, he mihi tēnei ki ngā atua, uh, ki ngā mate, uh, ki a koutou e te whānau e hui, hui mai nei ki runga i te kaupapu te pōnei. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, my name's Tamsin Hanley. And um, I call Ngati Pakia Tine, I'm Pakia. And um, I have just written and published a curriculum program resource, uh, which I call a CPR for short, because we need a bit of CPR in this area. And with it, I've designed a, a professional development package uh, for New Zealand educators and also. Uh, schools and boards of trustees. Uh, it takes the form of six books um, that educators read. And so I'm going to, my slides are going to talk about, to explain um, how this curriculum program resource works. Um, and I just want to apologise, mine's not a very, mine's, I'm using a lot of text, so I'm not using a lot of images. Um, because this is usually a lecture, and it's usually a three-hour lecture, and so I have to fit it into 20 seconds. So it's, I'm going to read my notes, so just apologising in advance. OK, kia ora. So these are the six titles. It's a decolonised beginner's guide for people who know nothing about critical and accurate Māori and Pākehā histories and the treaty, covering from the periods from the Māori origin story right through to the TPPA 2000, so educators can teach our students accurate histories. Leaving school, I knew nothing about things Māori, the treaty, accurate histories of all about being Pākehā. My education had not taught me any of those things. At 18, I hit Bastion Point uh, occupation, a key waterfront event that changed my life, growing up around the Okahu Bay, uh, but I didn't know that story. So I decided to learn that information and taught it for 25 years. No one else was teaching this, so I did an MA asking what New Zealand histories were being taught. 
Findings were that most teachers either knew nothing or a standard story of, of New Zealand history. Many teachers are monocultural, they avoid controversial content and believe young people can't handle it. Teachers want to teach us, so, but, don't have, but need support. I began to um, design a critical decolonised curriculum. The standard story uses discourses to ensure that the histories of contemporary problems are seen as unavoidable. All our resources in society legitimate it as it's presented as an accurate account when it isn't. It sustains our measure about what's happened. Current schools still teach that story, uh, but it's not our fault we don't know, we're not meant to know. In the current New Zealand curriculum, the ministry goal is that schools will enact this thing called a, whoops, I'm behind a slide, will enact a thing called a treaty principle, producing a wider ethnic citizenry that's knowledgeable about the treaty. I knew that from research that we won't meet the goal. Uh, so basically the ministry doesn't supply any resources that help us support us to do it, um, and none of them um, teach us about the two treaty texts. Generic primary social studies achievement objectives don't help teachers either, let alone teach our citizens' histories. What we tend to do is things like Matariki, we're not teaching about Bastion Point. We teach about migrations and not colonisation. Anzac parades, we're not teaching about land wars. At year 10, you're allowed to know about the treaty, but only if you choose history. So for the first eight years in this country, in primary, you don't learn anything about the treaty. It carries on in secondary with an absence of Māori dimension. Our students know more about the English monarchy and not the kingitanga. Um, there is excellent research that literature that student educators can use, but research says that teachers will not access that work or have time to read it. It also needs uh, translation into lower level materials. I knew then that a critical um, CPR had to include these things, indigenous settler politics, a critique of the standard story, and to address school knowledge gaps and pedagogies to teach controversial topics, uh, plus indigenous and settler material, all three treaty texts, and be able to update an um, experienced new migrant beginning teacher as well as an experienced teacher. So I designed this critical CPR addressing the research findings that meets the New Zealand curriculum goals for mainstream and Māori classes. It can be professional development for secondary, primary, board trustees and early childhood. The content is divided into six topics which are books to read. The six topics are beginner's guide for people who don't know, uh, covering from Māori worldviews way back then, European worldviews, what happened when they met, the actual legal Māori checks, tr uh, treaty obligations, what happened for 170 years afterwards, and in, but in this version you get a decolonised critical accurate histories. This, um, and the books have updated information challenging st teacher stereotypes about, say, Māori savages and cannibals, um, Pre presenting Māori positions that have been absent. Uh, after reading the core information, then junior and senior activity possibilities follow with images. These book one photos cover basic Māori knowledge critical to know if you live in this country, which ought to be normal in all our schools, teaching about tapu and noa and heniahoni and all those things. In the CPR, no teacher plans are provided. A teacher's craft is to read, resource and plan ourselves. So every teacher is expected to design their own, but from reading the books is exposed to updated knowledge, idea and pedagogies. So this year, two teacher plans evidence her discourses have changed. Also, um, the CPR has a variety of ways it can be used. The board can commit to reading the books. The staff commits to read the books over time frame for example, two or three years, and then staff select material to plan and teach. Um, the 2011 Education Audit Review Office research confirmed that the treaty principles is the least enacted out of all the principles, and revolutionary ministry policies such as kahikatea are not being enacted. So Māori achievement is still not at equitable levels in this country. Schools are still not managing to do these things. 
I'm suggesting that there won't be any change in, in inequities in schools because educators cannot enact the treaty principle until we address a lack of accurate histories, Māori and treaty knowledge and also knowledge about being Pākehā. We need to re-educate our institutions from the standard story. Um, the CPR is not a happy ever after solution. The answer doesn't, that doesn't exist. We just need to stop being superior over one another. CPR is an offering to help meet these brilliant policies, but citizens actually need to know these stories in order to honour the visions in the treaty, to know what happened and why and what to do now. Um, so schools can hire, uh, and then they hire me for a teacher-only day. They get hardened digital copies and uh, to copy and then use. We haven't had, I applied for funding with the ministry um, to get funding, but they said no, and so we put a mortgage on the mortgage of the house to pay myself a wage to write it. I contacted the ministry about the CPR, sent a set to um, Hekia Parata and didn't hear back from her for about a year. And then uh, about last week, I got an email from her or not from her, from someone in, in her, from one of her people in the, in the ministry, and they said they commended me for the work and the contribution to educating New Zealand children, but they were going to send it back to me. They're not using it. Kia ora. Kia ora. Oh. Christopher Dempsey, our next speaker. Welcome to the stage. No, I'm good, thank you. Um, so I hope you're all refreshed after your bear break um, and relaxed and comfortable and willing to get into the second half. Um, my name's Christopher Dempsey. I am... Um, uh, it says cycle advocate um, in the program. Um, I've been cycling for 30 of my uh, 30 past 30 years of my life, um, and so the bicycle for me is, is an integral part of my life. Um, so I ride around, and the you know the hub is a kind of a fixed thing, and the city kind of hums around me as I cycle through it. So how to make sense of it all? When I was presented with this particular topic, I was kind of like, how do I make sense of it? So hopefully over the next few slides I can show you what I, uh, uh, how I make sense of it in this particular way. Right, so who do I say go? Go, there. Um, that's my bike in northern Argentina um, at a small town called Huaco, where there's an old molino, a flour mill. And the guy is a statue of a famous poet, um, and he lived in the town, he grew up in the town, so a visitor's grave, and workmen were busy repairing his grave. The point is, my bike takes me places, marvellous places. Um, this is a map of the central cycle map. Because of the topography, it's a relatively limited amount of cycling that can be done next to the harbour, around Tamaki Drive, northeastern, and down Ongihanga Way. Critically, it's relatively easy to get to these places. Which then leads me on to the next point, which is land, sky, skyscape is sensuous. We exist in environments that affects us through our senses. It's hot, we feel the heat, the smell of freshly grown grass. We see beautiful sunsets reflected in amazing cloudscapes. Our environments press in on us constantly. So therefore, cycling is sensuous. You notice how much your senses are engaged when riding. Sight, smell, hearing, taste, touch are all involved all at the same time when riding. Memory too. At time, it's quite the sensory overload. It really impacts on your senses at all times. So cycling is an intellectual in exercise in moving through environments. You observe as you move the traffic, pedestrians, the way the cars are driving, but you also serve the environment critically. So some observations scattered in much the same way as input from our senses are scattered. Near to here, our industrial past frames beautiful sunsets, the harshness of the concrete softly rendered in the glooming twilight, the heat of the day rising from concrete, the sound of a basketball slapping the court. These are things that create sensuous spaces. 
and then heading in the other direction, we hit, hit Queen's Wharf, cycle up past Shed 10 to the end where the city falls behind you and the harbour in the sky arching overhead, reaching out the harbour and down beyond North Head while the harbour spreads itself in front of you, the scene bursts upon you like a firework that saturates you in an instant. It's all true, by the way. Cycling in the liminal space between city and sea involves two planes, the verticality of the building, buildings and other structures stretching into the sky, contrasted with the horizontality of the sea towards the horizon. The juxtaposition of these two planes creates a contrast in an energy that is excited, confined, then relaxed and calm. To pose, this is what I actually see when I'm riding back from my sister's place um, along Tamaki Drive, particularly when there's no moon. It's, it's a particularly nice time to cycle. The night, I hear the waves crashing on saw and I smell the salt air both arising out of this blackness to Po. It is quite magical. The northwestern cycle where I have a brother lives out to Atatu. Previously this route was to be endured a mix of services and widths. Now much improved but one thing hasn't actually changed. That amazing smell arising from the mangrove harbour, a primal smell full of pungency tying you back to this liminal space. Morning coffee at Takapuna. Duncan Laidlaw started a group that combines sunrise coffee with cycling. You go to an agreed place uh, before sunrise, have coffee, um, and then um, have coffee. One time I did it, cycling through an empty city, catching the first ferry, mad dash down to Takapuna Beach. The sunrise of the Hauraki was my reward. Old Mangari Bridge um, it forms a part of the route out to the airport. I often cycle this route, uh, riding across again, senses invade you. You're aware of tidal flats at low tide, the mangroves going around the, the foreshore, the tangy salt smell, and then of course up ahead to your right is Mangari. Jane Bishop was a young nurse riding home after a day at work. She was killed at the spot where the white car is. I like to think she had a lovely view out the Hauraki to, to Rangatoto around the corner just before she was killed. The sensuous nature of cycling often involves memories, some good, some not so good. The sensuous na nature of cycling is often fragmented due to speed you may be traveling at. Like this site coming down Corrin Street, the harbor is just a glimpse only revealed when you reach the bottom of the path to the left of the photo. And then we go on to another harbour glimpse down Grafton Gully. It's an industrial view of the harbour framed by Grafton Bridge. Beyond that is North Head and Rangitoto. But it's a glimpse not often seen. The path is relatively steep at this point and many cyclists whiz down at speed. I've done it more than a few times. It's fantastic. But if I turn around, what I get is the grand skyscape views, just grand framed by the iconic of bridges, Grafton. The sense of scale and majesty is lost in this photo, however, but the whiteness of the towering clouds, the way they billow out across the blue, sublime. Just magically sublime as you're cycling up. I love the colour of the harbour. It takes on a multitude of colours depending on the weather. On a sunny day, it's an intensity of blues. Other days, beautiful greys and purples. If you're driving, however, you're lucky to catch a glimpse. What you do see as you drive is mostly road. A little bit further on is the tide going out from Tamaki Drive Bridge just before you get to Napipi Road. It's a remarkable sight, the water steadily, powerfully flowing out. We may know the answer to how the flight tides flow, I googled it, but to see it in action, quite amazing. It's just, just amazing to see. View from my car down Jean Batten Place. But what's interesting here is how much of your vision is restricted and your hearing and your sense of smell. You're wrapped in sheets of steel and glass, cut off quite literally from the landscape. In conclusion, that place where sea meets city meets bike is a liminal space, packing out our senses to the maximum. You're incredibly privileged on your bike when you're riding it, so please make the most of it. Enjoy.
Good evening. I've been hiding down the back with the naughty kids. Um, my name's Matt. I work at the port. I've been at the port about five years. Um, ended up there after I came back from London. In London, I worked in the underground for six years and the railway before that. I seem to like infrastructure, big, dirty infrastructure. So here I am at the port. Let's go. This is the old port. No fence here. People everywhere. Horses. A few machines, but not much. Bustle and activity. Slow. Times have changed since then. This is more what it's like these days. Although this is an unusual photo. But I think this is how a lot of people see the port. Dirty, industrial, noisy, more machines, fewer people. And that's part of the story of the port. But there is a lot more to the port than that. The red fence, it's for safety and security, but it cuts us off from the people. It makes us appear secretive, and it does hide secrets, like this rock. This marks the spot where Auckland started, and the person who made it happen, Upper High Tekawa. Most people don't notice it. This is the skeleton of a wharf, Marsden Wharf, where the Rainbow Warrior was bombed some 30 odd years ago. It still amazes me that someone thought this was a good idea. The wharf is obsolete now, a victim of bigger ships, and over time it will go. And the cars, lots of cars, a sight that enrages many people, but I love how they look, especially from above, so many cars, how do you find the one you want? Systems, order, not chaos on the port. Cement, lots of cement, boring, essential cement. This is the dome that annoyed some and titillated others. It's a symbol of Auckland's growth. It can hold 30,000 tons of cement, but it never does because Auckland is growing too fast. And then the trucks, lots of trucks, carrying containers, lots of containers. None get lost. It's another example of systems, of order, of no chaos. Nearly a million containers a year, and none get lost. The truckies always know which one to pick up. And ships, of course, lots of ships, but not as many as we once had. Bigger ships mean fewer ships. Fewer ships mean fewer sailors. Less time in port, less time in the bars. More efficient, but less colorful. Reclamation. Not lots of reclamation these days, not very popular. But even reclamation has, a, and wharf building, has a, a, a sort of beauty. I may be alone, but I find this starkly beautiful utilitarian, muscular. But ports are about people, well, until the robots take over, like our pilot boat crew and the pilots who guide the big ships into harbour, a dangerous job. The pilots have to climb a rope ladder onto a moving ship, trusting, hoping that the ladder is well maintained and secured fast. And then the tug crews, it's the glamour job, People love tugs, and our crews love showing them off by doing a few donuts in the harbour. How many jobs let you do that? It's a life at sea, but without the loneliness being a tug crew. You get the views, and you get the fun. But you get to go home at the end of the day Here's one of our crew, hard at work. See, driving a tug's easy. Child's play, in fact. Which leads me to Seaport, as in Sea, the port. It's our annual festival open day where we get to show people behind the red fence and delight kids like this with experiences that are normally impossible. And she is actually driving. 
A lucky few get to join one of our tugs, for example, for the annual tug race. We have the most powerful tugs in Auckland. So the trick for us is not in the winning, it's in the losing without making it too obvious. But back to work. After the tugs come the linesmen who secure the ship to the shore. Very important. It's a job as old as shipping, and it hasn't changed much. Big, burly blokes hauling ropes. Here's some more burly blokes. These are the lashes, one of the last rolls still done by hand. These blokes secure the containers on the deck. The name comes from when the rope was used, but these days it's big, heavy steel bars. Then we have straddle drivers. They sit 13 meters high, driving the machines which move containers from truck to crane and organize the yard. Next month, we start building our new straddles 16 meters high, no driver, robots. Fixers and makers, clever people with dirty hands who fix things, invent things, make up new ways of doing things. They invented a remote control for our enormous cranes to make their inspections safer. Genius. And then there are the planners, the organizers, the IT people, the brains of the operation who plan ships, who organize the yard, keep the systems running, systems, order, no chaos. Time for me to go, thank you. So my name's Simon Van Prague. I'm the director at Fresh Concept. It's great to be here in this uh, wonderful facility. I have a lot of time for the Maritime Museum, so it's great to see these sort of activities here. Cool, ready to go, thanks. Uh, this little uh, quote from John F. Kennedy uh, back in 1962, it was actually relating to the America's Cup, which I don't know if that's where I find the relevance from in this particular quote, but it certainly stands true to me. Um, I think it's pretty powerful and I think there's something intrinsic uh, that we're drawn to about the water. Whether we arrived here by waka, by sail ship, however we came, uh, most, uh, many of our whakapapa uh, and the history of us have come from the shores. It's a place of arrival, it's been a place of departure for years a source of food, a place to meet. We're an island nation, hugely significant. Uh, I grew up in Wellington in Eastbourne, a seaside town that faces back towards Wellington City in the Hutt Valley. Uh, I had a childhood of wharf jumping, checking out sunsets over the top of Wellington. My school was across the road. I constantly looked at the water. It was a place we hung out as kids, and I'm sure many of you can sort of share a similar kind of similar stories. Wellington Waterfront is an inspiration to me. It's hugely connected, well loved. It's an exemplar of city waterfronts. It's used uh, for commuting, it's used for exercise, for markets, for, for many different things. Uh, and even with the fairly marginal weather, I have to be careful which sort of audience I talk to that about. It's still got plenty of people down there. So Fresh Concepts uh, the, is the company that I founded in 2008. Uh, we're a place uh, agency. We work in the realm of placemaking, community engagement, community development. This is the team that I have the honor of working with. We work within the realms of social media, um, strategy and digital, also activation on the ground. Um, so a realm of different things. We're really honored to be um, uh, to have a, a lease in a space called the Voss Yard, which is down in Hamer Street, which is 
uh, a fairly undeveloped part of the Wynyard Quarter, which will certainly change very soon. Our office is on the top floor, intensely hot during summer, super cold during winter, but there's something really magical about being right beside the water. Panuku Development Auckland, which is our landlord, uh, and the Percy Voss Charitable Trust have plans to restore it, which is, which is really encouraging. You walk into the space, you can smell the history. Um, it was a boat building site for, for Percy Voss from 1937. Um, it's had various projects since, but yeah, it's an honour to be there. So we won the public tender to uh, take on this opportunity of, of uh, activating Silo Park over summer. These three wonderful characters, and excuse me if you know Karen Goodall, I couldn't find a photo of her anywhere. Chris Morley Hall, who runs, who may be famous from the Cuba Street Carnival days of Wellington, Frith Walker, who's the place manager of Panuku, and Karen Walker, uh, as Karen Goodall rather, uh, were the team that I first met when I won that tender. And what I was presented with was this, and that got me super excited which was a blueprint that they had around the particular space of the Wynyard Quarter. Um, the idea of the activation and planning moving from uh, east to west, um, and that little quote really got me. Excuse me, I'm well out with my slides. So these are the four pillars how we approach place, um, which is identity, connectivity, accessibility, and sustainability. So this is what we measure everything that we do against, and having worked within opportunities like the Wynyard Quarter, we've been able to develop that further. Silo Park is one project that we've been working with uh, for the last, this is our sixth season in delivering the summer program at Silo Park for, for um, Panuku Development Auckland. Uh, we have a multitude of people that get involved. It's significant, our, our byline is a community of good times. It's essentially a framework that we see that is populated by different community groups uh, and different people. Um, and we certainly encourage people to get involved. Um, it is definitely programmed, but also lots of, uh, lots of initiatives are done outside of that by the public. This is an image of open streets, which was uh, something we delivered for Auckland Transport. What I find really powerful about this project on this day, it also coincided with J Japan Day, which was really cool up in, um, in Queen's Wharf. About 35,000 people came to this event but it was a road that severs the waterfront. It's an arterial route, and like many cities around the world, um, Auckland has this issue of, of sort of major, you know, roading that, that cuts off the waterfront. So it was really lovely and powerful to see it reclaimed by the people. Something we grapple with is the top-down versus bottom-up approach to activation. Um, what you have here on the right is certainly something we'd consider a framework, which was populated by um, community groups, but it's something that we constantly grapple with. This is an image of a project, a temporary architectural piece that um, Fresh Concept collaborated with Angus Muir from Angus Muir Design. Um, I guess I put this slide in, it reminded me of a successful um, project that we did, but also that there's been, op there's been plenty of times where there have been many failures, but still opportunities to, to learn from those and get success. I put this slide in because it still buzzes me out that um, you've got these two powerful harbours either, either side of Auckland and, um, and the tides are different and there's this immense force that's kind of driving um, on either side of the city. Um, I find that really intriguing and I think it does something to the people here, which is kind of, kind of cool. So the idea of a, of a common ground being the, the waterfront, the great connector, I look forward to seeing more of uh, the waterfront opening up. Uh, Matt, it's great to see behind the red fence. It's certainly something I'd love to see potentially be even further, further opened up. I also look at West Haven and look at boats that are sitting there and think of uh, all that kind of driftwood that a lot of it just sits there idle and how, how, what a wonderful opportunity it would be for people to be able to engage with those boats, use those boats not just a wealthy person's um, activity but the idea that people can, it can be accessible. Something I, um, which uh, also I find um, encouraging is Michael Parakofi's, uh public artwork which was just launched the lighthouse at the end of Queen's Wharf. Uh, it'll cause debate, it'll stimulate conversation, it'll bring people to the waterfront, it'll be device, it'll, it'll do all the things that public art should do. Um, and that for me is just another little, I guess, lighthouse of, of where Auckland's heading. And I do apologise, I know I was very um, 
uh, central Auckland and Waitamata focused, so I guess I was a little bit of a harborist here. But um, yeah, but um, yeah, it is it is a truly beautiful landscape that we're honoured to to be around. And um, yeah, thank you for your time. Last one for the night. You can all go home soon. Tēnā koutou katoa ko Rochelle Kahu McConnell taku ingoa, ko Nati Mani Poto taku iwi, ko Nati Huio taku hapu no mai haramai. Um, I am here today as an environmental and social capital broker and basically it's a title I made up because um, I find myself the person who stands wanting people to engage with to tire with the environment but instead of pointing fingers and saying I know what you should do, I realise that it's about building up capital, it's about connecting people, and then they listen with their hearts and then they want to be kaitiaki. So make up a title for yourself, it's great. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a map of Te Moana Nui Atoi, Te Kapa Moana. To you it may be upside down, to us it's not. Uh, this is the Māori world view. If you're standing on Te Waipunamu, the South Island, to Te Waka o Maui, and this is Te Ika a Maui, the fish of Maui, then you're looking back at the North, the North Island. That's our perspective. Degradation of the moana and the terrestrials um, and of the whenua. On the left-hand side, 1914, the pipe that you see is underneath Tamaki Drive. It is the sewer line that uh, dropped typhoid, cholera, amputation and fetuses into the home of Ngāti Whātuarake. Um, the photo you see there is, is to show the fact that we have Waimari, Waiora, healthy water, and then we have Waimate, dead water. Whenua ki te whenua. Whenua is our placenta to the whenua. Whenua ki te moana, from us, from the land to the water. This is what a cockle bed should look like. This is regenerative, this is biodiversity, this is resilience, and this is strength. This is normal. This is not what we see. The only place we see that is in Kawakawa Bay, and busloads of people are allowed to take 50 of them each per day. Um, I had the privilege of being one of the technical writers for the Taitimu Taipari Marine Spatial Plan. Um, on the left, we recognised some major inputs and impacts, development and forestry, a major impacts of inputs of sediment into the marine environment. Uh, pathogens are a degradation and a desecration of white order, and putting in a central interceptor to take our shit from the Waitemata Harbour to another harbour is not dealing with the issue. It's not being regenerative and it's not thinking outside the box. What you see in front of you, that pipe on the right hand side is a pipe that comes straight off Tamaki Drive. In the last, we just did some testing on it. The, the measurements from the first flush, 188 micro, um, micrograms or whatever it comes in of zinc, it's supposed to be 30. 48 of copper, it's supposed to be 10. That goes into the water every time it rains. That's my son. He's there to represent not only that Splore is an awesome place to go, but that nitrate levels in the environment are affecting our, are creating eutrophication. And we are now in a situation where we have ocean acidification, where the increased carbon and the increased nitrogen create carbonic acid. This Komato is Tamaiti Tamariki, he is my mentor. Um, what is regener regeneration? For the last three years we've been laying our own muscle reef restoration program. We do we have to do more harm, more than less harm. Um, Interestingly enough, MPI, Marine uh, Ministry of Primary Industries, is against any movement of muscles that are regenerative um, because we dump tons of them at one time to set up benthic um, areas because we may take some of these pests that actually came from the port here. So we're having to fight MPI. What, what I've brought with you now is our kairaranga, our weavers. This is um, our indigenous way of addressing aquaculture. 
but it's not aquaculture, it's marine, it's um, restoration. We'll be cultivating mussels onto these and hanging them off the pylons in Okahu Bay. Um, that's ma tauranga and Western science together, kaupapa Māori science, um, the way forward. Destructive extraction, marine debris, global warming, and now acid, acidic oceans. But with a whole living systems thinking, we, we have to become more inventive and more, and more creative. I'm going to show you these because I just went to an ocean acidification conference and these are cool. These are single cell coccolithophores and they're plankton, they're calcium forming planktons. On their own, they are affected because they break down from the acid in the oceans. Together, they actually are carbon sinks. If we work together, it's amazing. What you see in front of you is what I know as seeing Modi in, in visually. What those are are bivalves sitting underneath the sediment in the beach and the little pulses are oxygen that they're releasing into the sediment. With every breath that they take, collectively they are changing and restoring the environment that they live in. Oh, timing. Whew. Red seaweeds have been around for 1.2 million years. They know how to deal with acidic oceans. They know what to do. They have time to adapt. Right now, they don't. It's the speed at which we are acidifying our oceans. The green ones are the brothers who have been around for not so long. Together, they can increase, increase the acidity, no, decrease the acidity through photosynthesis. A way forward. What we did was we took mātauranga, we took science, we did hydrodynamic models, we did sediment testing underneath the moorings of the bay and we went to the unitary plan and we said, you need to shift the moorings. And so in a year and a half, there will be no moorings in Okahu Bay. In Taitimi Taipari, thank you. In the marine spatial plan, we also did something quite broad and thank you Matt Ball for being one of the MAD stakeholder working group members. We created Ahumuana. It's not just a marine protected area a kilometre around the whole coastline where community and mana whenua actually get to manage their own coastline for a change. What we do is we build kaitiaki for the future. These are our, these are our tamariki, they do all of our citizen science programmes. We've had eight years worth of kaimoana monitoring. We know that that picture of the tuangi, the kokul you see bef saw before, we've got 300 in the whole bay. We create scientists for the future. This is Te Waka Tawa, uh, Te Kotuiti Tuarua o Ngati Paua. Ngati Paua are the people who have their butts wet. They are in the water. They tell their stories. They have never given up connection of who they are and their people. I'd like you to please stand up. We're going to sing a waiata because this is my last song. I'm going to sing, you're going to reply, okay? Papaki mai. Ah, oh, hara mai, ngā naru nui, wā waratea, ngā tairere, e ripo e, ngā ngaru nui, te rehu Hey Koneira. Hey, Woo! You can go home now. Thank you. Well, it wouldn't surprise me if that's a world first where the whole Pachakcha audience is incorporated in a song in a wire so thank you very much to all the presenters for presenting tonight. I think it was an excellent event. Thank you again. And I think also it was really well worth to have that topic. I think Auckland uh, must be a very luxurious city to have the choice between uh, two harbors, between two languages, between two cultures. And I think they uh, doesn't really need to be a decision of um, just choose for one. I think it's, uh, it's a really opportunity to, to grow together and to create something really new. You know, I mean, in, in Europe, where I just came from, you know, it's, uh, there's no harbor in Berlin. You know, there's no second language. And I think this is a massive opportunity for New Zealand 
uh, to learn from the mistakes that happened in the past. I mean, the last presentation that we heard, uh, they tried to, to take those people, the, the land away 40 years ago at Bastion Point, and if they wouldn't have stand up for it, they, we probably wouldn't have a muscle restoration project today. And therefore, I think it is uh, really city meets the sea. It's full of opportunities for new um, areas, for new land to, to walk onto in a sort of um, mystical, um, you know, in a, in a thinking way rather than uh, developing all the land, of course. So thank you very much for coming tonight. And I hope you all learned a little bit and take something home from it. And uh, next Pachakcha will be most likely in a few months, uh, most likely about another hot topic, Auckland housing crisis, uh, most likely in collaboration with Unitech. So uh, keep on to the website and uh, subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, we always try to sort of go with what, what's on the hot topics and uh, have a slightly different discussion about it too, full of content from full of brilliant speakers. Thank you very much.